Chetel Pronval, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining yet again. Um, you, uh, we, we spoke last in July um, and we discussed uh, what was happening uh, with regard to the Tigray conflict. I'm very happy to have you back um, to give us an update and discuss some of the most recent developments, the developments that have happened uh, within the last six months. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for inviting me again. Cheers, yeah. Um, so a lot has happened. Um, let's start uh, when we spoke in July. The TPLF was making some gains on the ground. Um, there was, at that time, I guess, a maybe help me put it into perspective, uh, a smaller conflict that was going on, a military conflict between uh, the Tigrayan forces and the government of Ethiopia. Um, can you put into context what was happening then and bring this up to now? Well, when we spoke last, um, the Tigrayan Defense Forces, which represent um, the all-inclusive Tigrayan resistance, right. Um, right. had uh, recaptured uh, Mekile, the capital of Tigray, and a uh, large part of Tigray regional state. And um, the government forces and its allies, uh, Eritrean uh, defense forces and Amhara regional forces and militias, have uh, had pulled back from uh, Tigray proper, with the exception of West Tigray, uh, which still is under uh, control of uh, Amhara and Ethiopian forces. So it was kind of the tipping point of the war, you can say, in the sense that um, at that time, the, it, the Tigrayan Defense Forces or it, it's, uh, the Tigrayan government uh, had to make a decision on how to continue the struggle, uh, whether it should continue an armed struggle or whether it should move to a more political, um, diplomatic um, strategy. I think it, um, from the point of view of the Tigrayan authorities, it, the, the answer kind of gave itself, since at the same time as the Ethiopian forces pulled out of Tigray because they were militarily defeated by TDF at that time, they also imposed an uh, embargo on the region, blocking humanitarian aid, first and foremost, to the, to the famine struck population of Tigray, but also cut off electricity, cut off telecommunication, cut off the internet, cut off banking services, uh, closed all kind of transportation routes in and out of the region. And, and basically put it, put it in dark, both literally and, uh, and metaphorically. So um, uh, the TDF and the Tigrayan government didn't use long time before they decided that for us, uh, over the primary objective as it was stated at that time, were to um, lift the humanitarian blockage of Tigray region and to get uh, a genuine peace negotiation process ongoing. And in order to uh, effectuate that change, uh, they believe the best strategy would be to continue a military operation beyond the borders of Tigray regional state, meaning that pushing south uh, towards Addis Ababa and also pushing east into Afa regional state uh, in order possibly to uh, cut the main supply lines for all of Ethiopia, which goes from Djibouti and into Addis Ababa. Uh, and that's what they did. They, uh, they undertook uh, a massive kind of three front offensive to the east in Afar, uh, towards the south through Amhara and the main road towards Addis, and also towards the west, uh, into towards Bahidar, you can say, in Amhara regional state. And it was um, an intensive war uh, for several months. Uh, and um, one week, the TDF forces managed to push forward on all front lines. The next week they were stopped and uh, bogged down and maybe pushed back a bit before they continued uh, their offensives forward. 
they had a toughest fight seems to be in Afar on the Eastern front line where they met stiff, very stiff resistance from the battle hardened Afar fighters, you can say in Afar regional government forces. Also the terrain there makes it more difficult to conduct that kind of warfare. Right. Um, right. Most successful on the Southern front and actually then um, after taking Desi and Kumbolsho to significant cities in Amhara regional stake on its way towards Addis. Uh, they were captured in November last year. Uh, it really became obvious for everyone that, you know, if the trajectories would continue along the same kind of path as we had seen then for, for four months, uh, Addis Ababa would possibly fall into the hands of TDF. At that time, also when uh, reaching Desi, um, they also managed to link up in the field with the Orumo Liberation Army, uh, the other main uh, military opponent to the Addis Ababa government, which also kind of um, strengthened that uh, resistance block. Uh, they continued furthermore, but at the same time then the Ethiopian government had been uh, increasingly nervous. And uh, when the TDF and ULA reached uh, Debrecina, uh, a town just some 220 kilometers north of Addis Ababa in November, they called for the Ethiopian government and the Ethiopian prime minister called for a total war against the TDF forces. Uh, they called for all state and regional resources to be channeled to the war front. They called for massive mobilization of civilians to yeah, go to yeah. the war front um, without any training, without any proper military structure. Um, and uh, later on, Abiy Ahmed himself left Addis Ababa uh, to go to the war front and the claim that he should lead uh, the defense of Addis and the offensive against TDF from the front line himself. And at that time, we saw then a shift of the war. It took them from beginning well, of what July. What month is this? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where, where we are in the timeline here. Yeah, it, that, that is then the beginning of December last sure. year. Okay. Just a month and a half from today. Right. So it took them from early July until December, where you had seen a continuous uh, progression on the ground by the TDF forces and the OLA forces later on. Uh, coming closer and closer to Addis Ababa from the north, uh, uh, from the west. And um, it went so far as the city council in Addis Ababa called for all um, inhabitants of the city to uh, arm themselves if they had personal arms being ready to defend the city itself. And of course, also at that time, end of November, the government called for a nationwide state of emergency when they then made this call for total war against TDF. So it was on the brink. Uh, it certainly was on the brink. Although today, <laughs> the Ethiopian government uh, calls that a fabrication and a lie that it was never threatened. But when you when you read the statements, when you saw the actions taken sure, in November sure. and early December, it was clear that the government itself feared they would be toppled. Um, the change of war, uh, why the government managed to change the tide of war, um, there are many kind of hypotheses around that. I believe there are three key factors or four to that fact. And uh, it's a military factor, meaning that particularly as we saw um, that uh, the Ethiopian government over the last six months have undertaken a massive arms purchase spree and particularly focusing on unarmed uh, aerial vehicles uh, as uh, drones, armed drones, uh, as the needed instrument in the war. They knew how successful the drone warfare were in the early start of the war, November last year, and Jan uh, sorry, November 29, 
2020, uh, and uh, and when the war started, where the Emirates operated wars from their uh, military base in Assab. Uh, that was pulled back, the, the Emirati drone capacity, in uh, January when Biden administration took office. So since then, the Ethiopian government have been very interested to purchase their own drone capacity. And uh, by mid last year, uh, they started to receive uh, shipments, mostly through the Emiratis, uh, but the drones came from Turkey, from Iran, and also directly from China high capacity military combat drones. And they were assembled in uh, Addis in Ethiopia or at, at the, the military facilities. And they were deployed to the war around that time, October, November last year. And we know that those, you know, at that time, the TDF stood close to Addis in uh, uh, south of uh, Combolcho, closing in on Debrecina. They had a very extended supply line back to the home region. They were very vulnerable uh, in the rear. Um, and the drones took out the supply lorries, uh, driving in supplies to the war front, both uh, munition and, and, and uh, foodstuff and whatever they need, which made the offensive, obviously, uh, more vulnerable uh, on, the, on the front lines. At the same time, the flanks were very vulnerable from attacks from east from Afar and from west from Amhara. So, so in addition to that, uh, another military factor where obviously the effect of the total war strategy by Abiy Ahmed and the fact that the prime minister himself went to the front line, which created a surge of nationalism in Ethiopia in his constituency. And um, that surge of nationalism, civilians willing to sacrifice themselves on the front lines, um, also made it very difficult for TDF to maintain the military offensive. So they called then for uh, what they say, what they claim, a tactical retreat uh, in, um, in uh, early December or late November last year and started to pull back their forces north. The TDF themselves, or the Tigrayan authorities, say that, yes, this was partly due to the military, the changing military conditions, the drone warfare, but more so it was due to two other factors, uh, diplomatic and political concerns. The political concern uh, was that TDF and Tigray authorities have stated quite clearly from very early on in the war that they have no intentions, at least that's what they claim, they have no intentions to come back to the center to rule Ethiopia, as they did for 27 years. So was there ever a time where they were, uh, I mean, I guess it's just difficult to, 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 to really say, but I mean, did they ever have a, a, an interest in taking Addis, the TDF? Yes, they, they claimed they had an interest to go to Addis to topple Abiy if he did not open up for humanitarian supplies right. to Tigray and if he did not accept peace negotiations. They said that the only way we can facilitate those two demands, so to say, is to put pressure on Addis Ababa right. and if need be, go all the way to Addis. But and here's my point. They didn't want to go to Addis to reclaim power to rule Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. The articulated objective from TDF were to go to Addis to open up for humanitarian supplies to northern Ethiopia, to Tigray, to the famished population, and to create a transitional political process. Um, and to do that, they needed an alternative. And uh, yes, they had their alliance with the Oromo Liberation Army as a key partner. In the fall last year, they also created this federalist and confederalist alliance, um, a group of nine uh, actors, some of, most of them very small political military organizations in Ethiopia, ethnic based. Um, and they tried to hammer out, what can I say, um, an understanding of a transitional mechanism if they manage to reach Addis Ababa. 
later uh, uh, they had uh, they have admitted that that political understanding wasn't mature enough for that alliance to take power. That also kept TDF back to go the last mile to Addis. Possibly more significant is also the diplomatic pressure put upon TDF from um, November, early November last year, when the world recognized that actually it was a potential that the TDF ULA alliance could win the war uh, when they came closer and closer to Addis Ababa. And you know that uh, most of the embassies started to evacuate their personnel. Uh, and US and EU and African states also called for their citizens to leave Ethiopia and to leave Addis in case Addis would fail to the TDF ULA alliance. Um, at the same time, then, uh, when uh, the diplomats were concerned about their own safety, so to say, they started to put pressure on TDF to say, you, we will not recognize you or any alternative government you will put in place in Addis Ababa if you come to town. And particularly the US were very explicit in this pressure, um, uh, saying that uh, uh, warning TDF to put Addis under siege and warning TDF to go uh, to take the town. And I think, you know, paradoxically, the TPLF leadership are internationalists. <laughs> they believe in a, a certain international order and, uh, and um, they listen to uh, the big actors and particularly the US. And I think uh, the influence uh, that brought on the thinking of the TPLF leadership was clear that both, you know, the overstretched military supply line and the vulnerable rear and the drone warfare, warfare, the fact that they lacked a coherent, cohesive political platform to take power in all this, to start the transitional process, and the heavy US pressure and international pressure put upon them not to continue their offensive, um, all of these three factors uh, made them then withdraw. And later on in, in December, they say that we are not only pulling back from the Southern Front, we are pulling back all the way to our home region. That we're pulling out all forces from Afar and Amhara regions war theater. Um, so, that happened in, in the uh, uh, first, second week of December. And, and since then, over the last month, you have had a different kind of military situation on the ground. Uh, the war is continuing, but with different objectives, so to say, from both sides. And, and uh, uh, as we speak, <laughs> even today, we heard uh, on the 11th of, of January, when we sit and talk here now, Jody, that uh, it is a new bombing of a civilian target in Tigray. Yeah. A couple of days ago, uh, Ethiopian Air Force hit uh, an ID, IDP camp, killing 56 civilians uh, displaced and injuring dozens. So every day, more or less, since TDF pulled back to the home region, the war has continued with a drone and uh, aerial bombardment war against targets in Tigray, mostly civilian targets. They have also tried to take out the TPLF leadership, but they have uh, failed in doing so. The war is also continuing on the ground, uh, but we know very little about the details. It's continuing uh, on the um, southwestern part of Tigray, so to say. And, uh, and there are speculations as we speak that uh, uh, as part of this new political process in Ethiopia of a so-called national dialogue, right. uh, that, uh, that uh, federal forces might pull out of S. Tigray, but that remains to be seen. So, so let's talk about that. So Abiy Ahmed promised as he made gains um, 
against the TDF that he would make this sort of reconciliation or or this 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 sort of um, a small organization. What was it referred to? How did they refer to it? National Dialogue. National Dialogue, right. So what is the interest of the Ethiopian government for uh, continuing drone strikes, especially ones that are um, hitting civilians? I mean, this just makes them look bad or like sore winners, right? So, I mean, is this simply a failure of military intelligence? What's happening here? Why, why is this continuing if the TDF forces have, have all, all but pulled back? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and clearly, it sends out mixed signals uh, yeah. from the government of Ethiopia and their intentions. I mean, this prompted Biden to call Abby directly uh, uh, some days ago. I, I can't remember exactly when, right? I mean, this is... Um... Yeah, President Biden called Abby first time yesterday, okay. as we, uh, the 10th of January. Okay. Uh, um, first time uh, since... Uh, since uh, I don't know when he has he has called and spoke directly with Ab to Abiy Ahmed. Obviously, the U.S. pressure on TDF is one side of the coin. The U.S. has also put pressure on the Ethiopian government to um, to um, open up for uh, first of all succession of hostilities agreement sure. and then uh, peace negotiations. So far, the Ethiopian government have rejected that. They have not called for or accepted successional hostilities agreement or ceasefire negotiations to open up for peace negotiations. What they have done instead is that they have established this national dialogue commission and call for a national political dialogue in order to settle the internal challenges in Ethiopia. But notably, that national dialogue does not include the belligerent actors, the key opponents of the government, the TDF and OLA. It includes other civilian political parties, which are significant in its own right, obviously, but it it's then addresses a different context than the civil war. So far, the national dialogue has not converted into including the civil war aspects of the situation in Ethiopia. Um, the, release of political prisoners, which took place um, just about a week ago, uh, is significant. Um, there were two categories of prisoners. There are two reasoning for release of these prisoners. Um, the, there were the, the, the political leadership of the legitimate registered opposition party in Ethiopia called the Rumo Federalist Congress, Javar uh, Mohammed and Bekele Gerba, the, the leaders there, plus some other followers, uh, who were arrested way back uh, a year and a half ago or more when uh, uh, accused of being implicated in the killings of uh, Hachalo, uh, a very famous Rumo artist in June uh, 2020. Um, they were released uh, on the grounds, or they were released in the sense that they were not pardoned, they were not amnesty, their charges were dropped. So it was a technical legal matter which released them on the grounds that the government wanted them to be included in the national dialogue. And that's good, that's fair. These are very, very famous politicians in Ethiopia, and they they are representatives of the prime minister's own ethnic constituency, the Rome of the biggest ethnic group in the country. Uh, so it's significant and, and very, very positive that they are released. The other uh, group of released were uh, the chairman and the people um, affiliated to the Baldaras party, which is a pan-Ethiopian uh, uh, party, particularly popular in Addis Ababa and some urban areas of Ethiopia. Um, Eskinder Nega uh, is the chair there who were released uh, a very famous earlier on the journalist in Ethiopia. So also released on the grounds of to be included in the national dialogue going forward. And then you had a third category of prisoners being released, which were the old TPLF leadership or very distinguished members of TPLF, the most recognized one uh, our boys say about Nega, the father of Tigrayo, the father of TPLF, so-called, uh, and uh, Abai Waldo, the former 
chair of TPLF and the former president of Tigray region. They were notably released not on the ground to be included in the national dialogue process. They were released based on the humanistic principle, as it as the Attorney General Gedeon said, because of old age and right. ill. They were in their 80s. And, uh, yeah. Right. So, so already there you see that kind of distinction and that kind of mis mixed signals sending out by the government that um, we want to release some. Uh, they are cherry picking, so to say, opposition parties. They want to be included in a national dialogue, and they are maintaining an exclusion of and a terrorist stigma on the TPLF and OLA, uh, and saying that we are not interested to discuss with them. We don't, we don't talk or negotiate with terrorists. And uh, as you notably say, uh, they continue the war, the drone warfare, both in Tigray and also in Volga, as we hear. And, and that make, that should beg the question, what does the government want to do in relation to the civil war. Right. And how sincere is the government's interest to create national dialogue and all inclusive national reconciliation when they continue the humanitarian blockage of Tigray, when they continue the warfare uh, and drone warfare on civilian targets in Tigray and Urumia? Yeah, it's certainly interesting. And I think, you know, um, part of these drone sales. Um, you know, that may be a byproduct of the larger, our larger world of international relations. But I just find it so interesting that Turkey, a NATO member, is selling drone weapon or military weapons mm. to a government that we're, we're that, the, that, the, the, that the White House is putting pressure on or at least trying to um, come up with at least a diplomatic solution mm. to. I, I'm sure this has happened elsewhere in history, but um, is there anything to make of this? Yes, it is, because it is personally both the Turkey's involvement, but also certainly Emirati, right. United Arab Emirates involvement. Um, they, it seems, because the uh, arms supply flights have been tracked over the last seven, eight months. And most of these flights are coordinated through the Emiratis. Uh, with the exception of uh, some of the Chinese flights are direct from China to Addis. Um, and that Emirati is also a close ally of US in this right. region. Um, and remember when Biden first came to power, he imposed on the Emirati to close their military base in Eritrea and to stop the drone warfare on, on Tigray. And of course, also the involvement in Yemen. So something has changed here. Something has changed both in terms of international relations in, in the region and towards Ethiopia in general, but also US influence on their allies. And also US position probably has changed. And, and that's, that's what's um, interesting to kind of dig into uh, from my point of view, that uh, the very strong, an apparently coherent position the Biden administration had towards the Ethiopian war and its critical stand towards Addis Ababa from day, day, from day one they took office in January last year until August, September, October, possibly last year. Something changed. Something changed in October when it comes to the US policies on Ethiopia. And what uh, initiated that is unclear. Uh, it might have been, you know, a number of factors, both domestic concern in the sense that the Ethiopian, pan-Ethiopian Amhara-based diaspora in US, in Washington DC and other areas, they have put a very heavy pressure on the US administration, on their Congress representatives, they claim even to have, uh, you know, influenced the election of this by-election in, um, was it Virginia, uh, where, where the Democrats lost um, the seat uh, and, and the Republican took it due to the swing votes of the Ethiopian diaspora, com uh, Ethiopian community vote. Is that true? I've never heard this. Now, this is fascinating. Now, so, so they've made this claim? What, what did they say about this? They Republican? claim that, that because they encouraged their uh, uh, constituents there 
to vote not democratic right, because right. of the Biden administration's um, position versus Ethiopian government. Um, I don't know if it is um, if it is a validated claim. That would be that would be fa- that would be a great uh, research paper for a student. Or I'm very curious about that. That um, I, anyway, so, yeah, wow. But, but because then you know when when the foreign policy hit your domestic uh, sure. representation, <laughs> obviously that uh, creates concern in the White House. Um, that might be one of the reasons. But I also think you know. Uh, we are back to the hardcore foreign policy choices. Right. When, when the TDF approached Addis Ababa, I think the discussions in the US administrations were then, as we know, it happens when, when, uh, uh, when the greater security concerns are on the table. Uh, humanitarian principles and human rights are kind of secondary. Sure. Then um, I think uh, the hardcore agencies, Pentagon, CIA, and other three letters agencies said that let's let's stop these diplomats. You know, now the big boys have to take over, and and we cannot let uh, Addis Ababa fall because the ramifications of that uh, will be unknown, and there will be there will be severe ramifications of instability across the Horn of Africa and Eastern Africa, possibly. So I think uh, I think it was a hardcore political decision from uh, from uh, other actors than the State Department, and we saw then that Ambassador Feldman, the special envoy um, of the State Department, of Blinken, uh, became you know his his statements became very hard to read, so to say. It was inconsistent and incoherent, and I think. Uh, uh, he had clearly received the message that uh, you know his um, his office his um, was 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 not that relevant any longer. And as we know, he stepped down now just last right. week. Uh, so I, th- I think you know it, it was both maybe possibly con- domestic concerns about uh, uh, the pressure from the very vast and very big the Ethiopian descendant diaspora in Ethiopia now in in US in combination with with real hardcore security concern and foreign policy options where where Pentagon and CIA and other agencies came to the table and said let's let's it's up to us now to decide the way forward right. yeah I certainly don't see a um, a fallen Addis um, in the sense that Abby's government falls I don't see how that would be in the interest of the United States so I, they, they it seems that and I'm you know obviously speculating here but it seems that those security establishment agencies, would opt for um, a friendly government already in place that has some order there, right? So uh, th- this 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 seems like a reasonable um, or maybe a, a sort of Occam's razor uh, scenario here, but certainly it's it's difficult to um, it's difficult to to really know the truth there. Hmm. Um, throughout this entire conflict, as much as I've tried to keep my um, my, my finger on the pulse of what's happening. It's been incredibly difficult. There are changing narratives all the time. There's a, a constant shifts in um, the fighting on the ground, constant political um, um, shifts. One has to be, as you, as you are, um, an expert in uh, East African politics and Ethiopia in general, just to have a sort of cursory understanding of what's going on. It's been incredibly difficult. Um, there is, and part of the reason is because I follow a lot of uh, what people are saying on Twitter. I know it's probably not the best place to 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 get things, but people talk about this, and 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 look, all sides are on Twitter. They're on social media, and this is a part of understanding conflict in international relations today. Yeah. Everybody's online um, mm-hmm. mostly, and 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 are giving their opinions about this. Um, I noticed that when I posted our conversation last time, it was shared thousands of times um, by a variety of different actors. And um, you were your name was dragged through the mud, but I was also heralded by by um, others, depending on where they fell or where they where they, where their political opinion fell. I wanted to talk about this. Um, this phenomenon happening on social media, and I and I don't exactly know the specific question to ask, but it seems like there is a larger propaganda war 
happening. Mm. There's it's happening on Reddit. It's happening on Twitter. Um, mm. You get mm. you get um, people in Ethiopia with uh, depending on where they are uh, mm. giving their opinion and then bombasting any news reports of civilian casualties mm. or humanitarian disasters mm. as fake news. Um, so this fake news element that we're very used to in the United States has kind of made its way into African politics. I find interesting. Mm. Um, Mm. Uh, all of this is happening. There's everyone's everyone is accusing everyone else of lying. How do you find mm. the truth? What can you say about this propaganda war that's happened? What can you say about this muddled nature of 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 um, discussing uh, this the the Tigray conflict online? Do, do you know what I'm getting at here? Like I'm trying yeah. to describe it as best I can, yeah. but I'm I'm, uh, yeah. I'm 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 not great at it. <laughs> no, no, no it, it is a confusing landscape. That's for sure. Yeah, I think you know. Probably the most successful thing the Ethiopian government has done when it comes to the civil war in the country is the more or less total information blockout mm -hmm. of what's happening on the ground. Prohibiting, you know, cutting telecom, cutting internet, cutting electricity, uh, prohibiting international reporters and journalists to come to the country, prohibiting or limiting, strongly limiting the international reporters accredited, already accredited to the country to go to the field. Um, a complete con monopoly, more or less, on information coming out from the ground. Yes, we have some sources, uh, international humanitarian actors, UN agencies uh, are operating in the area or try to operate in the area. Um, if they talk, they are thrown out, as we have seen several cases of, of both UN officials and, and other humanitarian agencies right. uh, speak out of on the information happening in Tigray in particular, the atrocities and the, and the famine and so on. Um, so, so, you know, the fact that we don't have international um, independent verification or reporting from the war. This is the biggest war in the world without international reporting on it, right. basically, which is quite paradox today in, 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 in today's kind of global uh, information network. saturation. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that means that the government's narratives can be spun rather unchallenged. And we have seen that from day one, that the government propaganda machinery has been hugely successful to present their side of the war. And the government here, I mean, both the political uh, elite, the prime minister's office, the spokesperson, uh, linking up with the electronic intelligence agency, the government media, linking up with the Ethiopian diaspora, not the least, and of course also coordinating through Asmara, through Eritrea, and the Eritrean internet trolls. So it is a very much coordinated campaign presenting um, the government interpretation of the war and undermining all kind of empirical facts of atrocities have taken place in Tigray, for instance. And, uh, and uh, even, you know, claiming, for instance, one of the conspiracy theories is that the T TPLF itself are imposing the humanitarian blockage right. on, on people. This is actually presented by the government sources. It, it, it's, it's basically insane. Yeah. But, yeah. We do also have on the other side in Tigray uh, social media activists um, who are discrediting information on um, atrocities being conducted by TDF in Amhara and Afar region over the last four or five months. Um, so, so, you know, I'm not whitewashing uh, the other side here, uh, but the scale of things, <laughs> the numbers game here are so very, very, very different, uh, where one side has all the resources and all the access and the other side are more or less mute or blind. Right. Yes, we do, have, we do have access directly to Tigray and that's through, you know, a dozen or so of the officials in Tigray have satellite phones. 
So you can speak to uh, the president, Dr. Debrezion, and the head of TDF. You can speak to Gitacho Redda, who is the spokesperson of, of the government of Tigray and TDF. You can speak to some of the generals who have satellite phones, but that's about it. And on certain intervals, some of the civilians might manage to get out a, a text message or a mail or, or a tweet for that matter. Uh, so it is, it is very hard to, um, to balance uh, the, the information coming out. And, um, and of course, the first victim of any war is the truth. Right. And the propaganda war has been so intense and that has created an extremely polarized uh, situation uh, when it comes to describing this war. And uh, anyone outsider, be that as myself, a professor, a researcher, be that journalist, be that humanitarian actors, be that diplomats, even any outside actor trying to present a view which is not aligned to the government narrative. You are dragged through the mud, as you said. You are really being accused of uh, being a, a junta supporter or being a fanatic or being whatever yeah. uh, without, without uh, uh, where you have where you as a person is attacked without uh, you know not not your argument not your empirical argument uh, so it, it is it is um it is a tough terrain <laughs> to operate in uh, uh, for anyone who wants to comment on who want to analyze uh, the situation in Ethiopia these days. There is a there are there are a variety of channels on Reddit. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that website, but um, there is one for Ethiopia, which is is filled with um, Abi loyalists, mostly people that are just generally interested in Ethiopia. But in terms of the politics that are that are being discussed there, it's all um, status quo loyalists. And then there's also a channel for Tigray. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wildly different. It's completely different. The discussions that happen there are fascinating to see. You can pull up the, the political discussion side by side and see um, how this propaganda war is manifesting itself online. Um, the way things are framed, the way news reports are, are framed, mm -hmm. the same news reports can be uh, outsider, outside, Western news reports or Reuters, for example, can mm -hmm. be put up. And the way that they are discussed is, um, is quite different depending on um, one's perspective, one's loyalty to uh, which, whichever power structure in Ethiopia. And that's what, what it's made it, I think, for me, very difficult to, um, to, uh, to get through. But um, yes, as you said, um, you know, when, we, when I posted the, our last conversation, uh, thousands of remarks um, that, were, that, were, that were critical of, of, uh, of the discussion in, just in general. So yeah, I'm just, I guess I was just curious. Thank you for that. Um, just curious how, no, um, how it, yeah. It's, it, it is, um, you know, there are research into these issues now um, on, on how the narratives are being spun and the social media activists and so on. And, and I think that research are in the process to be analyzed and I'm looking forward to more publications on it. And the, you know, it is, it is, um, it is, um, very interesting experience to be in the midst of this uh, to a certain degree at least uh, and um, for instance the time frame people have on um, analyzing uh, uh, or on commenting or understanding your viewpoints um, i have been researching ethiopia for over 30 years uh, I came to Addis Ababa at the same time as EPRDF entered town. I have written 10 or so books, dozens of dozens of dozens of academic articles and reports on the failure of democratization, on human rights abuses, on political manipulation and conflict during EPRDF period. Probably one of the one of the researchers in the in, in globally who have written most critical stuff on TPLF and the EPRDF while they were in power. Now, when I continue to comment on uh, the politics in Ethiopia uh, and are accused then by uh, thousands and thousands of one being a, 
a TPLF loyalist and a junta, and none of them have probably read any of my work over the last 30 years sure. and just yeah. just just analyze it out of this the presence, <laughs> you know, just because of I'm not standing on their side, hence I have to be an enemy. You, you were the and only I, guest on this podcast that I received hate mail for. <laughs> yes. Join the club. Join the club. So so it is it is it is a it is an interesting observation. And for me again, this is research material. It just illustrates how a war, how a conflict is localized geographically, but it takes place all over the world because of the social media, because of the diaspora, because of the internationalization of um, of communication, so to say. And I yeah. So even here in Norway, you have uh, you have uh, actors on the ground who are part of this war. Mm. Sure. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we're almost at time. I asked you this question last time we uh, when we spoke in July, um, and it's a broad question, purposely vague, so you can answer how you see fit, how you how you feel, whatever, however you feel comfortable. Um, and I tend to ask all of the, the, I tend to ask this question to, to every guest, uh, just because, I mean, I think it's important that we mm. all check ourselves, right? What are we missing? What are we not thinking about right now? What should we be concerned with? Do you have any loose predictions of what's to come uh, uh, with regards to this conflict? Um, mm. how, how, where do we go from here? <laughs> yeah. Vague, vague. I don't mean to laugh, but I mean I, I'm laughing because it's such a, it's such a. Uh, I think it's a great, it's a good question, but it's also, I mean, it's it's vague. So I understand that it's it can be difficult uh, when presented uh, on the spot with 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 a question like that. No, yeah, it is a good question, and but it is also such a broad and complex question. Sure. And and I think um, some international diplomats, some EU ambassadors think the think the war is over so right. to say now, you know now tdf is back in the north they don't disturb Addis Ababa. they don't disturb the center and i know that many many development aid workers and many diplomats want to get back to normal again let's 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 start business as normal again you know um, I can understand that from a personal perspective, uh, because this war is dis disrupting their strategies and their work. Um, but to think that this war is over, I think is extremely naive and extremely dangerous, because it is more fragile now than any time before. When you see the counter reactions to Abiy Ahmed's call for national dialogue, for instance, when you see the criticism he receives from the hardcore chauvinistic and nationalistic audience in Ethiopia for releasing 80 years old TPLF members <laughs> uh, on, on uh, humanistic grounds, um, calling him a traitor, calling him a sellout. Uh, and when you see the agitation for continued extermination war against Tigray by certain actors in Ethiopia. At the same time, when you listen to the nemesis of the Horn of Africa, President Isaiah Safwerki, and his long-term three hours rambling interview he conducted the other day, where he unveils his ambitions and his sincere plans for Ethiopia. Um, this is this is just the beginning. Maybe it is the end of the beginning. To quote uh, a certain famous uh, um, head of state uh, during another war, uh, but but you know it's 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 really an extremely fragile situation in the Horn of Africa with the with the situation in Khartoum and Sudan uh, aggravating it, and and. Um, I think we should all be extremely concerned and uh, attentive uh, and continue to work uh, the best we can to try to facilitate the much broader, much more inclusive peace processes. It's not just one peace process which is needed in Ethiopia or the Horn. There are multiple peace processes which need to be initiated and to be 
carried out and to be implemented. Just in Ethiopia, there are four or five civil wars ongoing at the same time as we speak. Sure. It's not one war in Ethiopia. There are four or five different civil wars in Ethiopia with different objectives, different agendas and different actors. To think that this can be pacified by only pressuring one <laughs> dimension is, 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 is utterly naive. Uh, not including uh, Isaias of Werke and Eritrea's extremely uh, undermining and destabilizing role in Ethiopia and in Horn is utterly naive. Not viewing this in relation to what's happening in Khartoum and the instability there um, is naive. And behind that, Egypt again and the good. So, you know, sure. it is, I think that the world, the international community, the UN, you name it, have invested nothing in trying to understand the complexities of the situation in Ethiopia and has invested nothing in trying to help to solve it. It's a long way to go, my friend, before yeah. we can see a change which are sustainable and a durable peace in, in the Horn of Africa. Very good, very interesting conversation. I think that's a good place to leave it on. Shethel, I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you so much for for uh, for coming on and giving me and my guests, uh, my listeners, excuse me, um, a better understanding of what, what what's the best way to, to to characterize what's happening here. Is this a civil war? Is this a conflict? How, how do you describe it? Uh, what what, do you, what word do you use at a cocktail party in the in, in Norway? <laughs> we don't have many cocktail parties in Norway. Okay. <laughs> Norway is the only country in the world which is not allowed to serve alcohol these days, my friend, because okay. of the because of the virus. No, uh, it is the civil wars of Ethiopia, I call it, but it's not the civil war because it is an internationalized war. Sure. Since Eritrea is heavily present in the war theater, but it's not yet internationally recognized as such. Yeah. So it is. It just it is a mess. That's the best characterization of it. Fair enough. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Um, Thank you, I hope Jody. to have Thank you, you on everybody. again. Yeah, uh, I hope to have you on again. Let's let's talk more as 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 these things unfold. Thank you so much. Thank you.